I was meeting it, sit down to pray. I said, Lord, I just pray for peace in the world so we go forth and preach the gospel. And that's what this world needs. It needs the gospel. That's the only thing that will bring it in to war. Well, with that all being said, I want to start off with a story I read this morning. It, and it was a story that a lot of uh, uh, seminary students knew from this one Baptist college. And it's about this, uh, many years ago in England, uh, a leading actor was, all, was asked to recite for the pleasures of a fellow guest. And he consented to ask if there was anything special that audience wanted to hear. And after a moment of pause, an old clergyman presented himself and said, could you recite to me the 23rd Psalm? And the strange look passed over the actor's face, and he paused for a moment and then said, I can and I will upon one condition. And that is after I recite it to you, my friends, my friend, you will do the same. I, said the clergyman, surprised, but I am not an uh, echoacusis, a, 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 a person who can speak with find words. However, if you wish, I will do so. And so the actor recites the Psalm 23 in this very beautiful and amazing way. Hey, the people are spellbound as they listen to this actor recite Psalm 23. And as it finishes, everyone is amazed and they clap and they, it's a wonderful moment. And then as it dies down, the actor now puts his hand to the old clergyman and said, please, would you recite Psalm 23? And as the old clergyman stepped up and he recited Psalm 23, with all his love and affection, he said Psalm 23. And at the end of it, there was an applause but there also was not a dry tear in the audience. And the actor told the young old clergyman, the reason was, I recite Psalm 23, but you know the shepherd in person. That is why when he, the old clergyman recited, it created surprise and tears came to people's eyes because he knew the Lord as she recited Psalm 23. And so my question is for you. Do you know the shepherd? Do you have the same re relationship that this clergyman had, where he cites Psalm 23, and you can see there's a personal relationship, a bond. You know, Psalm 23 is one of the most beloved psalms in all of the Bible. In fact, if I was to ask all of you right now to recite Psalm 23, I bet all of you could recite it flawless and perfectly. Everyone knows Psalm 23, and in it, it reveals who the good shepherd is, this, this, the, who this man of, of the Bible is. To some degree, I believe it's describing Jesus there in Psalm 23. And often when we know a psalm so well, we can easily lose the significance and the meaning. And so today, I hope we will look at Psalm 23 with fresh eyes as we look at the good shepherd of Psalm 23. And real quick, I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. Um, All right, Psalm. All right, Psalm 23. In theory, I should be able to do this throughout the Bible, but. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare me a table in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we look at this beautiful psalm, we're going to look at three key things. We're going to look at our provider, our security, and our blessing. Our provider, our security, our blessing. So let's look at the first part, our provider. And starting on verse 1 again, let's reread through this, and we're going to get the details. So the, the first part again, the first part, and often we miss, as you see there, a psalm of David. We're going to come back to that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me die down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. We're going to stop there. The first thing I want you to notice, and it starts off with a psalm of David. And now a lot of us, when we recite Psalm 23, as I had originally did, we skip that part. We don't read a Psalm of David. But if you look at the Psalms, often on the top, you'll see a Psalm of David, a Psalm of Asaph, a Psalm of Moses. And it might say, with, be done with string instruments, instruments, or this is when this event happened. This subtitle, let me encourage you, as you read the Psalms, look for those subtitles, because those ones, in particular in the Psalms, are actually part of that first verse even though we don't normally read it. So it's important to us to read that because it gives us the description of why this is happening. Who's the author? What is the historical event? What, sometimes the instruments. Who are they be singing? And it tells us a little bit about the psalm. And in this case, it just tells us simply a psalm of David. Now, who is David? Is David the king of Israel? And some believe David wrote this particular psalm when either he was in flight from maybe Saul or in flight from Absalom. When he was fleeing for his life, and as he's in the wilderness, he pins this psalm, is what some scholars think. And that kind of shades our understanding as we look at Psalm 23. Just imagine him pinning this as he is leaving Jerusalem for the sake of his life. He's running away from Saul or, or, uh, or, or Absalom. Think of the troubles you've had, times when you have struggled. Think of this psalm. This is a psalm what a person who is going through difficulty. This is not a time of peace. This is a time of struggle. Then it goes into, the Lord is my shepherd. However, the real Hebrew word is not Lord. Now, the word Lord is actually a Hebrew word being, I'll come back to that, meaning Adonai. Now, Adonai is the literal word for Lord. But here, it is not Adonai. It's actually this word Yahweh. The, and if we had a Hebrew Bible and we open it up, it would have the Y-H-W-H. And the most literal understanding of that would be Yahweh. And so that's actually what's there. And, and that's why whenever you read couple L-O-R-D, that's the word Yahweh. Now, but then some of you might ask, well, how do we get Jehovah? And Jehovah is you take Yahweh, the constants of Yahweh, and the vows of Adonai, you jam them together, then you bring it into Latin, and then from Latin, you bring it into English, and eventually you end up with the name Jehovah. And so that's why in the old King James Version, a lot of times they have Jehovah. Now, why do I get into this? It's because we want to understand this name Yahweh, because he says, Yahweh is my shepherd. Well, who is Yahweh? And the thing that's interesting about Yahweh is instead of like Lord, Lord would see what do you think of sovereign and king? Well, actually, the name of Yahweh is more than just saying he's king. It's more than just saying he's Lord. It's more than just saying that he's God. Instead, 
the word Yahweh literally means I am. You know when we say I am who I am? This is part where this comes from. It means I exist. I am here. I am now. It, it's not that God is past tense or future tense. He is at this moment, is. God exists. But the name Yahweh even has more significance because when God called Moses and he introduces, I am who I am, eventually he's on the mountain and he has God to reveal himself to him. And on the mountain, when he reveals himself to Moses, he says this, Yahweh, Yahweh, God of compassion and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and kindness and truth, who keeps his love and kindness for our thousands, who forgives iniquities and transgressions and sins, that he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And when you want to say, so this is what he says, Yahweh, Yahweh, this is what he, we want to think of. This is a very definition. What is the God of Yahweh? He's a God who is a compassionate God. He's a gracious God. He is abounding in love and patience. Love and patience. He is patient. He's loving. He's forgiving. And he's righteous and just. When we hear the name Yahweh is more than just saying, Lord, Lord is, is, is not even close to what we understand. We need to understand when we see Yahweh, may we think of Exodus 34, because that's really who he is. And so when David calls upon the name, the Lord is my shepherd, this is a thought that is permanent in his mind. This is the God he's thinking of. And you notice he says, my, sh my the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, this is a God who is not a, a, a God that is distant or far away. He didn't just start the universe. He's not a deist God that starts and leaves no, this is a personal God. You notice all these things are our personal relationship to us, that that is God's character to us. It's something we, we are to know, and David knew him. And so as he goes through Psalm 23, he's telling you, let me tell you about the God of Yahweh who's loving and kind and gentle. Let me tell you about this God that we worship because I have experienced it myself. He's walked with them, and he has seen this godly character in his own life as God has ministered to David. And so that's why the name Yahweh is so important. But no one does he describe him as Yahweh, but he describes him as a shepherd. He is my shepherd. And a shepherd, if you think of the Old Testament times, it, though it wasn't the, the most regarded profession in the world, the idea of a shepherd was, in fact, kings and pharaohs and emperors and many people pointed to a shepherding of people and a shepherding of God's people as one of the most God-honoring things you can do. And so David, being a shepherd and seeing what it was like to be a shepherd, he then says, well, I want to put this in words you understand how God loves us. He loves us like a shepherd loves his sheep. By the way, that means we're sheep. That means we're not the brightest bunch. It means that sometimes we follow the crowd. And sometimes we all fall off the precipice. That, that, you know, uh, but we are the sheep and we look to the shepherd. And to some degree it reminds us we are dependent upon God. You know, one of the things that me and Nett often talk about is too often we have this self-independence. We're so uh, self-independent in our own ability and our own strength and our own ability but what this psalm actually declares is we are not independent we are dependent we are dependent on God to be our shepherd our guide in a direction we need a shepherd and as you go through life you realize it as you trip and fall and stumble you realize I need a shepherd I need a guide. I need someone to walk before me and show me the pitfalls so I can fall, uh, so I don't fall into traps and temptation. We need a shepherd in our lives. Amen? What does David mean? 
I shall not want. I shall not want. Now, he doesn't mean that that means I, I, I can, I'll have everything I want. That if I go outside, there'll be a Mustang or a Ford Bronco waking, waiting outside for me. And that my, that, that my house will be paid when I get home. It doesn't mean that. What it means is God will provide for your daily needs. As a shepherd provides for the sheep, he leads and guides them and takes care of them what their needs are. And if you walk this Christian life long enough and you look behind you, you can see all the areas of your life where God has ministered to you and direct you. No, not always the way you want it. You wish things would have went differently. I often tell Gannett, I wish I would have finished up college sooner. I wish things would have moved fast a little bit. But God said, no, Jared, this is the path I have you on, and it's going to be slow because I'm still developing you as a leader. And so God guides us and provides for us, and sometimes it's just enough, just enough to take care of us, to provide for our needs. Now, he then talks about three cents of how he provides for us. And the first is that he makes us lie down in green pastures. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Now, David, being a shepherd, would have known this. That as a shepherd, you would go and have your field. Now, when you think of green pastures, don't think of Maine. Maine has really green, lush pastures. No. In Israel, there are areas when the rainy season comes, it comes and hits the mountains. There's areas where grass grows. But it's like tufts of grass here and there. But, and the herdsmen will go around and lead the sheep to where the, the grass is, and they would feed, and there's just enough for them. And they would lead the sheep to another place, and they would feed. And so he, he leads them to green pastures to feed them. And it's a reminder that God provides for our basic needs. He, it isn't a feast. It isn't a, that he just said, hey, this is one field. It's all green. We're going to stay here for the whole year or for years. No, each couple of weeks or days, they move from one green pasture to another green pasture to another green pasture. And it reminds us that God just provides for our daily needs. It's like what Jesus said, uh, give us today our daily bread. And, it's, but, and the reason why that is, why is it just daily bread? Why is it month or year? Because God wants us to be dependent upon him. I mean, it, it, in the Psalms, it talks about, if I had overabundance, Lord, I might forget about you. And if I had nothing, I might curse you. So, Lord, basically give me just enough. So I will depend upon you and give praise to you. But you also notice it mentions, makes me lie down. Makes me lie down. And you see that sometimes the sheep need to say, here, you need to sit down here. You need to eat here. You need to rest here. And I'll tell you the truth, beloved. The Lord needs you to rest. Often you going from place to place, you worry about the stress of life. You're just go, go, go. And sometimes even tempted on Sunday to say, well, I got too much to do. I don't have enough time to go to church. Or maybe you wake up in the morning and say, I don't have time to do my morning devotions. Or maybe your evening devotions. And you just rush about and you never stop to rest. Uh, and I tell you the truth that the first year we were here, that's what I was doing. I was rushing and finally after that first year, and then it said to me, we can't keep doing this. You need a rest, and we need to see you, Jared. And so we had to start regularly taking the day off, me resting. Because if I'm not rested, bad things happen. When we're, when we're not rested, we become stressed. When, we get, when we're not rested, we make mistakes. When we're not rested, we hurt people's feelings. We need the Lord, to make us lie down. And let me say this, beloved. If you don't learn how to lie down and rest, God's going to make you learn how to lie down and rest because you're going to get sick or ill or exhausted and or break a leg 
and he will make you lie down. So it's better for you to lie down before the Lord makes you lie down. The other thing is that's why, remember Jesus said, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God knew we need a Sabbath. Or we need to have a Sabbath of the Lord. We need a day of rest in the Lord. A day where we let our body rest. A day we let the land rest. The day we put down all our works and trials and tribulation. Where we just rest and we spend time with family. A day where we rest and focus on God. We need to rest. God did not, even remember, God worked six days and rested on the Sabbath. Now, did God need to rest on the Sabbath? No, but he set a model for us to follow that we are to work, yes, but we also to rest so we can focus on our fellow man, so we can focus on God, so we can focus on resting our body, heal, and rest. So learn to rest, and the Lord will teach us that. Then it says, he leads me beside quiet waters. You see, sheep don't like rough water. Sheep like still water. And if the water's too rough, they might not drink from the water. If the water's too rough, they won't go through the water. And what it is is they, they don't like anything unexpected to happen. I never forgot the story. I, I, I don't know if any of you know, Ken Davis is a Christian comedian speaker and he said on his family farm, he once went up to one of the sheep who was always pushing him into the electric fence. He went up to the sheep, hid behind the corner, and went, boo! And it so startled the sheep, the sheep died. And his dad said, what happened to Herman? I just went, boo! And he died. And the dad's like, no. Later on, when he gets older and his dad is, you know, again, this 70s and 80s, and he pulls Ken back to us, over to him, say, and, and, and D Ken Davis thinks, oh, this is going to be this one father-son moment. And his dad pulls him up and says, what happened to that sheep, Herman? Really? What really happened? He said, I went, I went, boo, it was really loud. The sheep don't like to be startled, but you know what? When I think of a sheep and how they don't like being startled and how they just kind of go with the flow and everything, they're like us. Well, how many anxious, anxieties, stress, worries, cares that take away our peace, that take away our tranquility, that take us eyes off the Lord and take us off, we're worrying and fearful and uncertain, and we take our eyes off of our good shepherd. We are like these sheep who often are so easy to be terrified, where people go, boo, and we run, and we, we, we jolt, and we do stuff that normally we never have done. But because the right people say, and they say something that's scary and frightened, we respond. But we are to keep our eyes on our Lord, keep our eyes on the shepherd who's going to take us beside quiet waters and trust him that where he will take us will be peaceful and restful. Trust the good shepherd to lead you to quiet waters. Beloved, he also said and says, he leads me, uh, he then goes on and says, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. And this we can understand in two sense. Now, first we understand restore means to bring back, to rejuvenate, to restore. And the soul is actually a word that is often means breath of life or uh, uh, living. And so really what we got is, in this word, he restores my soul. We could say he brings us back to life. And how does God bring us back to life? We can talk about it in two cents. One is physical, and clearly this is what he's been talking about, this physical need for rejuvenation. We need shelter, we need food, we need clothing, and he will give us strength. And if we, he'll make us, we will give us strength and we will run and not go weary, right? And he restores my soul to do the task that God has called me to do. He will restore my soul physically, but more importantly, and I think there's a hint of this, is he restores my soul 
spiritually, spiritually, I need my soul restored because of the worries and cares of the world, but more importantly, I stumble and I fall and I sin and I need to be picked up. I need to be restored and redeemed. I need a someone to restore my soul because difficulties happening. Not only that, but I need my soul restored because it can become a hopeless world. You know, we turn on the news and we hear about Israel we hear about the economy, we hear about politics, we hear about what happens and the LGBTQ stuff, and we can make us quite hopeless. But this is where one of the things, we gotta keep our eyes on the Lord. He can restore our hope, our life, our, our soul, by keeping our eyes fixed on, ah, he's in control, he's in control, and he will give you hope because he says, ah, he is my Lord, and he will bring all things forward according to his sovereign will he can give me life and one of the ways we can uh, work with God to restore our soul is we need to be in prayer we need to be in our Bible we need to sing God's word we need to be engaged in fellowship we need to do these things engage with God and it will help restore our soul when we would draw from church when we withdraw from God's word, when we withdraw from prayer, it, when we draw from fellowship, it makes it harder for the Lord to restore our soul because we're pulling away from God. And when we are stressed, when we have anxiety, when we feel hopeless, the last thing you want to do is go the opposite way. You need to go to the person who can restore your soul and go to the word and prayer and fellowship. Now moving on is, we're going to move on to our security, our security. Sean, uh, verse 3, part B, says this, He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, the sheep must be completely trust the shepherd to guide them. The, 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 and when, when we think of shepherds, you know, a lot of times we think of these nice green fields, but we need to think about the shepherds in Israel. It's not the most hospitable place in the world. And often they go through valley and gorges. They have places where there, there's these wadis where the water w used to go through. And actually I was reading one of my commentaries how if you get far enough down, the, because there used to be water there, there's a lot of strong humidity and it makes it stifling to breathe. And there's these crevices and cracks and it's a very narrow road and it can be easy for the sheep to fall off one way or the other. And so God, the shepherd needs to guide his sheep through the right way or guide me in paths of righteousness that I need to be guided in the right way to go. And, you know, when we think about guiding me in path of righteousness, we can say this. There's two sides as we walk through this narrow road. You now, broad is narrow that leads away to destruction, but narrow is a way that lives to eternal life. Well, on one cliff, on one side, is uh, uh, legalism, where we give into legalism and, and, and works righteousness and just religious activity and say, ah, that, 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 and that can fall off to one side. Or the other side of the cliff that you need to be careful, which is you're so focused on the grace and mercy that you, you end up in licentiousness, you end up in sin. And there's two extremes that you have to avoid because one leads to one kind of sin, one leads to the other side of sin, and you need to stay in the straight and narrow, and you do that by following the shepherd. You know, one of the ways that as a disciple, if you're being discipled, quite literally the, the idea of a disciple was the, uh, the rabbi would go first and the disciple would fall after, quite literally following the exact same steps. In fact, if a rabbi was training his disciple, would the, whatever the rabbi did, the disciple did. So if the rabbi ate, the disciple would fall. Well, how does a rabbi eat? And then follow. Well, this is the same thing. We need to follow the shepherd. He has the right way to go, and we have to trust him. Now, it's interesting. He says, for his namesake. Now, what does it mean to do it for his namesake? 
Well, for his name's sake, what we need to understand this is if it is done in his namesake, is saying that it should, uh, in biblical times, your name meant something. And when you said that person's name, it would be all the character value of that person. I mean, we think about the name Yahweh. And if Yahweh is described about this merciful, gracious, loving, patient God, then for his name's sake, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, has to live up to those things. And so he's saying, for my name's sake, for my righteousness, for my glory's sake, I will follow what I've told you. I will live up to my name. And therefore, we know we can trust him. We know the path of righteousness would be good. Now, how can we know for certain what God's righteous path is? Is it by our feelings? Is we determine which righteousness by what other people say? Do we determine the right way by what the government say? No, the only way to know where the path of righteousness is you know God's word. I know I talked about this last week, and I cannot talk about it enough. God's word is where we discover truth. In fact, Psalm 119, 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is God's word a light to your feet? Is it, you say, I, I always go into God's word to know how to live my life, how to love my wife, how to take care of my kids, how to operate in a secular world? Are you using it to understand what is God's truth? What are the areas I need to repent of? What are the areas I need to live into the spirit? Do you go to God's word as your path of righteousness? If you want to know how God guides your path of righteousness, you need to read his word. He even says this in Proverbs uh, 3, 5 through 6, one of the most popular Proverbs says, trust in the Yahweh in with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your way acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. It is by relying on God and what his word says that will guide you on path of righteousness. It's don't trust your heart. Your heart can be deceptively wicked. Your heart can go after wrong things. And so the way you can make sure you're on the right path is go back to God's word, and it can be trusted. Now, it goes on uh, to verse 4, and it says this. And even though I walk through the valley of shallow death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff did comfort me. Now, the valley of shallow death, I, mean, I was talking about this early, how there were these cross and crevices that you'd go through. And in fact, if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, the, uh, the, the, there's a, a person going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as he's going down, these men from the cliffs attack this man, and he falls into danger. And quite literally, these were dangerous places. People actually died as people traveled on the roads. They weren't safe. And that's why often when you travel, you go in caravans of people because it was safer in numbers. And so it was a dangerous place. And it's like us today. We, we have situations where, we've, where we're fearful. Maybe we're fearful of diseases. Maybe we're fearful of the government. Maybe we're fearful of what's going on in Russia or we're fearful of what's going on in China. We sometimes, or, or illnesses or sickness or cancer, and we, we feel like we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. And so here we, so, but what do we do? First, we have to have a God, good shepherd in our life. We have to have not to fear. I do not fear. Why doesn't he fear? I do. Fear no evil. Why doesn't he fear? Because like, oh, 
I didn't have it in here. Romans 8.31 says what? If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who? And then Romans 8.28, and we know that for those who love God, no, all things work together for those who are, who are called according to no, I want you to say that again. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So we have one, we know that God, if he is for us, who can be against us? And we also know that God will work all things for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. We have these certain promises. And so when we go to the valley of shallow death, we go back to those promises. Okay, I got it. I shouldn't fear. And this is how, you know, I've got Paul and Silas in the prison. They're in jail. Things are horrible. And they're just singing praises of God. I know it's also reminds you when John and Peter are getting whipped for proclaiming the gospel. And they said, praise God that we're able to suffer for the gospel's sake. You see, though, and though they went to the, the shadows of death, they didn't fear God because they knew who their Lord was, that he would walk through them, and that he would work everything for their good purpose. is isn't always easy. Now, you notice it also said this, not only is, uh, uh, not only this, but he then says this, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you are a shepherd, you would have a rod. And the rod was just kind of a club thing so that when wolves came, when animals came to attack your flock, or maybe thieves came, you would have this rod or club to beat them away, to keep your flock safe. God keeps you safe. He defends you. But not only that, but he says, to your staff. And you think about a shepherd's crook, where he would carry it and he uses it to guide the sheep. Or you can imagine when a sheep going the wrong way, taking that hook and pulling him back. No, come this way. And so God protects us and guides us. And this is what we need. We need God to guide us and protects us. And ultimately, the way he does this is through his word and by his spirit. By his word and by his spirit, he protects us and guides us. And then specifically going to God's word, it says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is a living and active and sharper than two-edged sword, piercing as far as division of soul, spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is going to guide you, direct you, convict you, and, and then as God also guides us through the Holy Spirit, I said, through the, and uh, convicting the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, John 16, 8. And then also in John 16, 13, but, he will, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. There's two things that help guide us. There's two things that help protect us. We have the Holy Spirit and God's Word. And we need to pray for God's Spirit to guide us and direct us and I often am praying that with me and that we pray for God's guidance and direction, uh, how the church is to be led, how to how our family is to be led, how to raise Joshua up in the Lord. We're always praying to God for wisdom and direction, and we're always looking for God's word for wisdom and guidance and direction. And we go to God as our rod and our staff. Now, before I move on, and as we consider this, God is our uh, protector, our guardian. I was thinking about this morning um, how often we don't really trust God. We often say we trust God, but I think there's some of you who may actually trust maybe your Second Amendment right to own a gun more than you trust God. I think there's some here that maybe you trust the government more than you trust God. There's some who trust your medical providers or, or, or what 
our military can do. Now, let me say, I like the Second Amendment. I like the military. I think there's something the government does right. But I tell you the truth, beloved. Your Second Amendment, guns will have mistakes. We'll have military will make mistakes. Government makes mistakes. Doctors make mistakes. Do not put your trust anywhere else than the Lord God. He is your principal guide, director, and protector. Those other things are good, but those things should never supersede God and God's word. And I fear and I worry that sometimes as Christians, even as conservative Christians, we look to those things to protect us and not to God. But the Lord should be the thing we look for for protection. And then one of the reasons I, I love the Declaration of Independence is it says this. Don't, the whole point of the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution is you are not to put your trust in the government because government can be twisted. It can be corrupted. It does sin. And so that's why they create checks and balances and all that because they were trying to, yes, give government power, but then restrict it. Don't understand that there are some things that government, you should not look to government for, but look to the Lord. The Lord is to be your strength and guide and direction. Let's move on now. Our blessing, our blessing. Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Now the picture changes from talking about a shepherd to now talking about a host, a change of scenery. Some believe this scene depicts maybe a city of refuge that someone goes to, or it could be someone who is a guest in someone's house. But one thing we know is when you are in someone's house or if you went to this town of refuge, no one could do anything to you. You are protected there. And even though your enemy may want to go after you or attack you, you are safe there. And that's why he's having this meal in the presence of his enemies. You can just imagine if he is in one of these villages of refuge that the enemy would like to kill him. But according to the Old Testament, there's nothing they can do until the, the high priest passed away. And so he was protected inside that city of refuge. Or if you're a guest of someone, when you're a guest of someone's house, the, the person who are your guest of will protect you. Well, who are we the guest of? We are the guests of the Lord God. And if God is our host and we are his guest, then is there any enemies that can attack us? No. Is there anyone who can do anything against us? No, because we are the guests of the Lord and he's going to prepare a table before us. And what this is an image of, of is God's blessing in our, house, in our life. And that's why it uses this word anoint with oil. And this is a sign of often when you had a guest, and especially a special guest. Let me say, if you are in the Lord, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a special guest. And, he, and it talks about he has anointed him with oil. Now, anointing of oil was given to special guests. Also, as anointing oil was used for prophets and kings. It was a point to that they're to hold this person in high regard. And you have the blessing of the Lord if you have him in your life. And not only that, but your cup overflows. And if it was overflow, it says that the blessings would stay, that the host does not want you to go. It's like, keep it coming, keep it going, that, that your cup is overflow. When you're in the Lord, he will bless you and guide you and direct you. And, and it points back to what we talked about earlier, the blessings of he will provide for your daily need. He'll provide you for security. He'll provide for you to guide and direct you. He will provide for you hope. 
He will provide for you. And those are the blessings of God, and no better blessing is to have the Lord himself as your host. And then he goes on in verse 6. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The good is the blessings of God. As I already talked about food, shelter, protection, for all the good things proceeds from the Lord. You know, all good and perfect things, as James would say, come from the Lord. If you have any good things in your life, if you've received anything good, whether it be your clothes, your house, your car, your friends, your family, if you have food, if you have any good thing in your life, those are the blessings of the Lord. Those are the good things that God gives you. But not only do you have these good things that God provides for you, but you also have the loving kindness of God. And this is actually from a Hebrew word that says chesed. I love that word, chesed. And chesed is this loving, covenant, faithful, gracious, merciful love of God. You notice it sounds very similar to his name, Yahweh. This chesed love. And in the New Testament, it would become the, the Greek word agape, this covenant love, enduring love, patient love, merciful love. And that is what he gives to us, his goodness, his loving kindness. And it will not, will it just pursue me for one day? Will it just pursue me for this year? No, it's going to pursue you for the rest of your life. Because if you are in the Lord, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have had him forever. And when you are in his hand, nothing can take you from God's hand. You have his loving and goodness forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so nothing can take it away. And that's what gives us that encouragement that helps us walk forward to know that we will always have the Lord's love. And not only that, but he uses this word, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, or Yahweh forever. Here we have this image of the temple, the temple of Israel. Dwell in the house of Lord. That's when they said the house of Lord was the temple of Israel. And, and it's actually the holies of holy, the place where, where God dwells. And ultimately what we see is our spiritual destination is to be with the author, the perfecter, our lover, our savior, the one who redeems us. It's our relationship with God would be with him, that we would be brought close to God like a friend, that he would love us like a father. And if, if you didn't have a good father, he will love you like your father should have. He will be the perfect loving father that we all long for. He is that God and we will be brought near to him in relationship and redemption and be sons of daughters of God and we will dwell with him forever. And that's where Urban is right now. He is dwelling with the Lord forever. He has been set free, and he has his goodness and love and kindness around him forever. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure every once in a while he thinks about us, but I guarantee you right now, Urban is just basking and dwelling and amazed that the, the Lord who has saved him, the Lord that has redeemed him, is his, and he's wiping every tear from his eyes. And that's what we look for. That is our good shepherd. The good shepherd who goes after us when we wander astray and we live reckless lives. He goes after the lost one, reaches down in the crevice, puts the sheep on his shoulder, and carries them home. That is our good shepherd, beloved. And let me say, if you do not know 
Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as your good shepherd, if there is an inkling like, oh, I would love to have a God like that. I would love to have God in my life. Please accept Jesus. Repent and believe and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can have this good, save, this good shepherd. You can have the good Father. You can have the Redeemer of your soul. And if you have questions, I pray that after church we can sit and talk about Jesus Christ. We can pray together. And so we pray for that. And we finish off with a quick thing. May we find rest, peace, security in the loving arms of the Good Shepherd. If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you, and have a good day. Yeah.